Addison, thank you. Shanara, please. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, the, the title of my section is Corporate Tax Avoidance. What more can be done, if anything? So you may have covered quite, you probably covered most of the ground, but this is your opportunity to, to uh, think through what else we could do. So I'm going to start off with Alex. Um, do you agree with HMRC's definition of tax avoidance as bending the rules of the tax system to gain a tax advantage that Parliament never intended? Uh, I mean, that's fine, but it's not measurable. You know, I think we've we probably moved beyond that in the international yeah. discussions. Um, yeah. And so since 2013, we've had this definition, which is, or this goal, which is to reduce the misalignment between where profits are declared and where the real economic activity takes place. If we say that that misalignment is the problem, whether we call it avoidance or in some cases edging into evasion is mm -hmm. less important than that our aim is to eliminate it. And I think that's, you know, that's the agenda now. How do we eliminate that misalignment? And at the same time, perhaps deal with the kind of professional advisor companies whose, whose businesses are built on selling schemes to widen that misalignment. Right, and you, you mentioned earlier that uh, the UK alone loses about, uh, I think you said, 25 billion a year. Uh, and yeah. also in uh, the piece that, um, the, the research that your organisation produced, um, which was the subject of an article in November, um, you referred to the four, uh, 427 billion a year of lost incomes because of avoidance by companies and rich individuals. Um, and you've talked about country by country reporting and some of the kind of uh, challenges in trying to close that gap. Um, could you say more about um, what else could be done, uh, building on what you've talked about before um, to, to tackle this problem? Sure. Um, so in the State of Tax Justice uh, Report 2020, we find that the UK and its dependent territories between them are responsible for about $160 billion of revenue losses worldwide. And that's more than a third of, of the total. And that's losses both to multinational uh, companies profit shifting and individuals offshore tax evasion. In both areas, the UK has this, this entirely disproportionate legacy. But the UK is also suffering revenue losses itself because, of course, other yeah. people play this game too. So there's a potential for the UK to impose better conditions, better standards across its own territories and here, and at the same time to benefit by seeing lower losses. Now that would start with transparency measures. You know, we've seen progress in the automatic exchange of information about financial accounts, but we need more information uh, in the public domain. We need lower income countries included. We've seen country by country reporting, one of our own proposals introduced, but the data is held privately. We need that to be public. We've seen where some of that data is made public, for example, for European uh, banks and financial institutions, an increase of about 10% um, annually in the amount of tax paid. So significant amounts of money simply from a transparency measure. That's on the UK's legislation already, but the Treasury chooses not to enact it, an obvious step. right? And then we're looking into, I think, thinking about how you change the tax system and what we've talked about before. What are the kind of unilateral measures that you could put in place to make sure that the profits of multinational companies declared for tax purposes in the UK actually align with the proportion of their economic activity that's here. The current international rules don't come close to that and HMRC's measure doesn't capture that difference at all. So they always seem to present these very small numbers when actually the scale appears to be much bigger. Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, Chris uh, Sanger, um, how would you approach, just picking up on some of those points, any of those points, particularly uh, whether about definition or this point about um, transparency, how would you measure or assess, not measure, assess the success of the government's overall approach to tax avoidance in light of these figures that, that we've just talked about? I think we have to be very careful on the definition of tax avoidance because uh, what Alex is talking about is uh, is effectively a, a gap in the system that we have uh, where profits are attributable uh, correctly under the systems that exist today to countries outside of the UK where he uh, would argue they'd be accessible into in the UK. That's actually a, a result of the system as it is today rather than the behaviour of, uh, of, of companies themselves. 
Um, when we look at uh, tax avoidance as defined by HMRC in their tax gap, uh, as you quite rightly quoted, that's much more about um, uh, changes in uh, a, a contrary to what the intent of, uh, of Parliament is in that space. And we've seen significant reductions uh, in uh, corporate tax uh, avoidance and indeed of the overall avoidance part in the uh, in HMRC's tax gap, corporate tax is, uh, is, is pretty small in that space. Um, over time, we've seen, um, we, we saw back for 2005, we saw the introduction of the uh, disclosure regime. We've seen that changed over time. We've seen the increase in, or the introduction of the general anti-abuse rule that was brought into, uh, co uh, into corporate tax. Uh, Alex mentioned as well the uh, automatic exchange of information that's available now under our, uh, under our double tax treaties as well. So we've seen quite a lot of activity in this space. And if you were to look back through the uh, the red books over the last few budgets, you've seen that we're getting um, uh, lower amounts that are being ascribed to um, uh, to tackling avoidance, and I think that is because the system is becoming far more far more robust. Right, um, and, and the overall, you, as you rightly say, compared to the points, the the numbers we're talking about um, in Alex's report, it's a, it's about four point four billion, still a lot yeah. of billions. 2.6 billion of, in small business and then just under a billion for large and medium size. Um, but would you say that actually, you know, while the, the HMRC um, has uh, done a lot of work on this, um, the focus alongside continuing to bear down on the gap, the focus needs to be on these big numbers and the, the international angle. Do, do you agree that the Treasury um, needs to respond to the point that Alex has made about um, publishing, not leaving it private and so on? Well, I think the question about uh, country by country reporting, I mean, it, just to be clear, that information is going back into the hands of the tax authority. So HMRC yeah. already has all the information it needs uh, in order to be able to identify where it wants to uh, to inquire. Um, uh, the country by country reports that were included as uh, as action 13 of the uh, of the BETS project we talked about before, are designed to be given to uh, tax authorities that already have a lot of other information. And I think they, they're they an aggregation of the activities that are undertaken on a uh, on a country basis. And therefore, if you were to uh, put those broadly into into public, then they would, uh, they would be pretty misleading. And right. if we see what companies have been doing themselves, they've been, a number of them have volunteered to, uh, to publish their own country by country reports, but giving more information to allow them to be properly understood and there is the uh, the uh, initiative next uh, next year of the GRI companies the global reporting initiative from uh, from 2021 companies uh, for which tax is material will be reporting uh, public country by country reporting so that information will become uh, available in the future so there's definitely a trend in companies taking the actions themselves but tax authorities already have that information uh, with which to to respond uh, Tom and Annie, do you want to come in on any of these points? Um, yeah, just a, a couple of very brief things, actually, in terms of stuff we could look at to, mm. to reduce corporate tax avoidance. Uh, I mean, I think one thing is the deductibility of debt interest expenses. And I've spoken a lot, perhaps too much, uh, about my desire to see a more generous approach to business investment in the UK tax mm. system. Mm. But I think part of letting businesses write off investment costs um, faster and, and, and more fully um, is that you would want to get rid of or at least significantly dial down um, the deductibility of debt interest um, and one of the key ways that companies are able to shift profits around the world is by making loans from one part of a company to another um, and then paying off the loan and, and claiming back the interest expense to to reduce their tax liability um, so i think that there's a there's a potential win-win there from both the tax avoidance and a growth standpoint. Another thing, and this is a bit more pie in the sky, so I'll be very brief, but um, the US in 2017 came very close um, to shifting to a destination basis um, for its corporation tax, it's effectively taxing where the consumption happens rather than where the production happens. Um, and taxing where production happened made a lot of sense in an industrial economy, um, you know, going back decades. Uh, whether it makes sense going forward when things are increasingly digital and intangible, um, I think is open for question. And so although it would be a very radical move, um, whether we want to think about really redefining the corporate tax base in that way, I think is an interesting prospect. Annie. Yeah, I mean, I on the transparency point and, and the publication of country by country reports, 
I would agree with what Chris said. Is it, how useful is that information when um, the tax authority already has has that information, and it is very technical in nature. In the UK, we obviously have um, uh, tax strategies that companies have to publish, and if we feel that they're kind of insufficient in in terms of giving the the public the information that they need uh, about corporate um, tax behaviours, then I think that's the better place to look rather than kind of um, and yet another thing. Um, that needs to be published and, and thinking about the kind of the, the admin cost of that, but also uh, the, the fact that it could well be misleading information if it's only about UK um, affairs when it's a when it's a global company. So I think I think thinking about explaining behaviours and why things are, are the way they are and, and transparency through the tax strategies is, is more useful um, than technical data, which is often mis, uh, misrepresented. So can I just bring Alex back? And while I've got you all, um, I just wondered, it's slightly off topic, but I just wondered if I, if you had views on the FinCEN papers and Panama papers, obviously we, there was a reference to Panama earlier. Um, I know it's not directly linked to this, but there is a wider issue around how we address this issue um, in relation to the wider agenda around, around um, avoidance and evasion. Alex. Yeah. I think these things are related and, you know, the FinCEN papers provide a good example of, you know, one issue where you have data, but you haven't, or it, perhaps deliberately you've underfunded the regulator so that in fact it can't deal with that data. And it's only when you get a group like the ICIJ putting in some capacity that you find out there was a lot in there. Um, similarly with country by country reporting, we know that a tax authority can use it in an individual audit, but when that data is in the public domain, as it is for European banks, you get many eyes on it and you get a public accountability. You also get an accountability of the tax authority to the public because the public can see whether or not they're addressing profit shifting. So there's a lot of value to that data being in mm. the public domain, not just held by tax authorities. Um, and I would say, you know, Chris mentioned the GRI uh, standard. Obviously, I worked very closely in the in the technical group in developing that, which is, I would say, immodestly part of the reason why it's a much more um, technically robust standard than the OECD one. I'd certainly like to see that made the basis for public reporting. But at right. the minute, the OECD standard is is what we have, and we really need that in the public domain. There would be zero compliance cost to doing it. If I could ask Chris a question, it would be, you know, what share of EY's revenues come from providing tax advice and what kind of changes to the international tax rules we'd need to see happen before that advice stopped being a big part of their, their business model? Chris, maybe uh, you, could, you could address <laughs> my point as well as Chris's, uh, Alex's question. Uh, I mean, I, I think if we look at what's happening with the country by country reporting, I think Alex, as Alex was saying, there's a real need to uh, to make sure that information that's being put out into the public domain is actually valuable. Uh, Alex says it puts great more eyes. I mean, I think one the point being that information provided to one tax authority is then available to all tax authorities. So there's a huge amount of uh, of capacity for tax authorities to look at the uh, look at the information. Uh, and it's not just one tax authority that if it chooses not to look at it, then won't see other things. Um, in relation to uh, in, to, in relation to EY, I mean, the, 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 re the role of EY is to help our clients comply with the tax regime uh, and indeed that's the the whole nature of the of the work that we the work that we do and whilst it's a complex tax regime that will require uh, um, complex uh, responses and, uh, and advice and our, our aim is to make sure we help our clients um, comply with uh, their obligations um, any other uh, would anyone else like to come in on on the, any reflections on uh, the last question around FinCEN papers and Panama papers I'm happy to leave that one to, to Chris and Alex, actually. They sort of covered my points between them. Okay. Annie, did you want to come in? Uh, no, I think I, I agree um, with, with Chris that actually um, I think it's more useful that um, information is in the hands of the tax authorities who can actually act um, mm -hmm. and, and investigate at the back of it. I think um, within things like the Panama Papers, there's obviously a lot around personal uh, tax uh, arrangements, which which I, I don't comment on, um, it, it's not always about business. So I think I think there there is clearly a broader thing there about about the treatment of uh, of personal taxation, which which those sorts of um, those sorts of uh, sort of evidence uh, attributed 